Hello, um, hi everybody. I'm Martin Press, the uh, Livestock Officer with the Riverina Local Land Services based here in Wagga Wagga. Thanks for joining uh, Riverina Local Land Services tonight for the first of the three Better Bull Buying Autumn Beef Webinar Series in uh, partnership with uh, Southern Beef Technology Services, New South Wales DPI, Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit, and the Holbrook Veterinary Centre, Production and Breeding Services. River and Local Land Services is proud to host this series of webinars for regional cattle producers, landholders, industry representatives, and students during March 2022. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Radri people who are the traditional custodians of the land. I'd also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present of the Radri nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians who are present. This webinar is recorded and will be available for future access via the River and Local Land Services website found under the events tab. A few house rules. Registered attendees will be muted, but questions can be submitted via the chat room. There is around fifth, oh, sorry, there is around 45 minutes presentation time with two to three breakout periods for the presenter to address questions submitted via the chat section. Tonight, making bull uh, selection decisions for heifer, uh, heifer matings is the um, is 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 the first of the three series of the webinars tonight. By Katrina Millen, Technical Officer, Southern Beef Technology Services, um, with the Agricultural Business Research Centre at Armadale, New South Wales. Again, as you would have seen on the flyer that was sent out, there are two additional um, uh, webinars that are coming up over the next two weeks. One on Wednesday, the 16th of March, uh, a similar time, 7.30, 8.30, with the Southern Multibreed Project Update by uh, Brad Wamsley from uh, the DPI at Armadale. Uh, also then on the 23rd of March, uh, similar time, 7.30, 8.30, we've got production and breeding in Southern New South Wales slash managing bulls to ensure the genetics work. And that'll be presented by uh, Dr. Shane Thompson from the Holbrook Veterinary, uh, Holbrook Veterinary Center Production and Breeding Services. So please join these, web these following webinars to obtain you know, the latest information regarding uh, better bull buying for Southern New South Wales. But now please uh, welcome Katrina Millen from Southern Beef Technology Services to present making bull selection decisions for heifer mating. Thank you, uh, uh, Katrina. Thanks, Martin. So, so yeah. it's great to be here tonight to talk about bull selection decisions for heifer matings with everyone. Just going to share my screen. Yep. And just while I'm talking, I'll turn my web webcam off, but I'll turn it back on for questions. Okay, so as Martin has said, today I'm gonna to be talking about bull selection decisions for heifer matings. And there's two main topics that I'm going to cover tonight. The first of these is which breed plan traits are important for heifer bulls. And then I'm going to run through how to select a bull to use over your heifers um, with the, the breed plan traits of importance uh, being considered. So I guess when we think about choosing a bull for your first calf heifers, what we really want is for that first calf heifer to give birth to a live calf, preferably without any calving difficulties. And so it's important that we select a bull with suitable genetics to help with this. So I thought I'd start off by putting up a couple of graphs of some individual animals. Now, I am aware that this is a little bit of an unfair question to throw at you straight away with, is this a heifer bull when many of you may not have seen the EBV percentile graph. So I'm just gonna walk you through what the EBV percentile graph is showing us first, and then give you some commentary on whether or not I think these are heifer bulls. So um, if we think about breed plan EBVs, we have a range of EBVs or genetics within a breed and they go from the top of the breed to the bottom of the breed in what we call percentiles. So those percentiles go from zero to 100. So on this graph, this line here at 50, that's our breed average. 
And we can see in 2022, our breed average EBVs are currently for the 2020 um, drop calves. Now that's because firstly, those 2020 drop calves will have had all of their traits uh, recorded, but also they're the rising two-year-olds that we're expecting to be for sale in the coming bull selling season. So down this side, we've got each of the breed plan traits. So for example, here we've got calving ease direct, and you'll see that this, uh, direction is harder and this direction is easier. So if we look at the 50th percentile line or breed average, anything on this side is easier, anything on this side is harder. Um, now this is a, a little off topic, this isn't about heifer bulls, but just a general note about EBV percentile graphs. Um, in general, it's better to be on this side of the graph but not always. So there are some traits where it might actually be better to be more in the centre, such as mature cow weight. Um, milk can vary depending on what, what traits your, sorry, what your environment is. And also things like rib and rump fat, you might want more fat if you're not making the specs or less fat if your um, animals that you're turning off are over fat. So just a note that it's not always best to be right up here in the top, top percentile. So having hopefully explained a little bit of how to interpret the uh, EBV percentile graph, I guess if we come back and look at this particular animal and think about whether or not it's a heifer bull, we can see that for the calving ease traits, calving ease direct and daughters, this bull is on the harder side, it's below breed average, it's got a longer gestation length and a heavier birth weight. So I would say, in my opinion, despite the fact that this bull has got really good growth over here. He's got harder calving ease and heavier birth weight. So in my opinion, this is not a heifer bull. Um, so this is our second bull that I thought I'd put up tonight. And we can see he's got the opposite profile of the one we just looked at if we look at the yellow calving traits and the green growth traits. So much easier calving ease direct and daughters, short gestation birth, very light, short gestation length, very light birth, but no growth. Well, some growth, but below breed average growth. So I guess there's a lot of people out there that would use this bull as a heifer bull. Um, he's certainly got the easier calving ease and lighter birth weight profile that people may be looking for in a heifer bull. However, the downside of this bull is that he doesn't have the growth profile as well. So, I think this sort of bull is more of an ideal heifer bull. He's still got the easier calving, short gestation length, lighter birth weight, but he's got positive growth. He's above breed average for growth. So I think um, if we've got a choice, this sort of bull is the type of bull that we could be looking for to use over our first calf heifers. So I guess that little introduction has summed up some of the traits I'm going to talk about tonight. So I think there's four breed plan traits that are really important when we're thinking about selecting a bull to use over first calf heifers. Now these are birth weight, gestation length, calving ease direct, and if you're a self-replacing herd, calving ease daughters. If you are fully terminal and you're not keeping any of your daughters, then we can disregard calving ease daughters, it's not going to be important to you because you're not retaining females. But for anyone keeping keeping replacement heifers, calving ease daughters is a trait to be considered. So I'm just going to run through each of those uh, traits to start with. So um, the first of those was our birth weight EBVs. Now these are estimates of the genetic difference between animals for birth weight and they're exp expressed in kilograms. And what we see is that generally small or more moderate, so around that breed average, birth weight EBVs are generally consider, considered more favourable. And that's because these smaller or more moderate birth weight EBVs indicate lighter birth weights. And that is obviously a contributing factor. It's not the only contributing factor, but a contributing factor to calving ease and preventing birth difficulty problems. So um, throughout the presentation as well, we've got a number of breed plan tip sheets that are available on the breed plan website um, that allow uh, that explain how to interpret and understand each of these EBVs. So there's a QR code here. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to make the slides available um, after the presentation, but 
that there is a QR code and that is the birth weight tip sheet to look for if you are interested in more information on that, that particular trait. So the second trait of interest is gestation length EBVs and these provide an estimate of the genetic differences between animals in gestation length and they're expressed in days. So in this particular case we know that shorter gestation length is generally uh, correlated with lower birth weight, less calving difficulty, so lower or more negative gestation length ABVs are generally considered to be more favourable and that's because they indicate shorter gestation length. So Breplan also has two calving ease direct EBVs, uh, two calving ease EBVs. The first of these is calving ease direct. Now this is the one that is important for all herds regardless of whether or not you're a self-replacing or a terminal herd. Um, and this is the one that estimates the genetic differences in the ability of a sire's calves to be born unassisted from two-year-old heifers. So it's all about if we use that sire will his calves be born unassisted over heifers? Um, now, calving is direct EBVs are reported as differences in the percentage of unassisted calvings. And in general, higher, more positive calving is direct EBVs are more favourable because they indicate a greater percentage of unassisted calvings. And the last of these uh, for traits that I think are really important for heifer bulls is calving ease daughters. So calving ease direct is how well will that, that size calves be born out of two-year-old heifers. Calving ease daughters is how well will a sire's two-year-old daughters calve without assistance. Um, once again, it's reported as differences in the percentage of unassisted calvings. And once again, higher, more positive calving ease daughters EBVs are more favourable because they indicate a lesser percentage of unassisted calvings. So they're the traits that I think are important, but there's a couple of issues when we consider these as a package. So firstly, while low birth weight EBVs should reduce the likelihood of calving difficulties, they're typically correlated with low growth. And so if we have a look at this particular graph, we can see that we've got uh, easier calving ease direct. Sorry, wrong one. We've got lighter birth weight. So this animal is in the top 10% of the breed for birth weight but it's also in the bottom 10% of the breed for 400 day weight. And I'd say that's about the 85th percentile. So bottom 15% of the breed for 400 and 600 day weights. And so we're seeing lower birth weight, lower growth potential. So our solution then is to look for a bull that gives us both, both a lighter or a more moderate birth weight but also good growth. And if we have a look at this example, we can see that the bull uh, sits in the top 10% for birth weight, so it's a lighter birth weight, but also in the top 10% for 200 and 400 day weight, and the top 25% for 600 day weight. So he's got good genetics for birth weight and also favourable genetics for growth. And these are the bulls that are typically termed curve benders by the industry. And that's because they're breaking the trend that we typically see when we think about how these two traits are related. So that's what an individual bull would look like in terms of his EBV profile. But I just wanted to show you some population data to show you that if we look across a breed at a population level, we can see variation in, the, in those those available bulls. So this is a breed that is used in Southern Australia. And what we have on this graph is a um, birth weight along here. So this is uh, birth weight averages here. This is lighter birth weight on this side and heavier birth weight on this side. And then the y-axis is 400 day weight. So average in here, lighter 400 day weight, 
and heavier 400 day weight up the top. And so it's a little bit hard to see the trend and I haven't put the trend, trend line in, but in general, as birth weight grows, goes up, so does 400 day weight. So we see a positive relationship in this direction. So if we then think about it, this quartile here is bulls that have that typical uh, relationship. They're below average for birth weight and below average for 400 day weight. And this quartile up here, also typical bulls with that typical relationship profile, above average birth weight and above average 400 day weight. Now down in this quartile, we've got bulls that are above average birth weight, so heavier genetics for birth weight, but they don't grow very well. So they're below average for 400 day weight. And then in this top quartile, these are the bulls that we want to try and identify for our curve benders. We've got bulls that have below average birth weight and above average 400 day weight. So these are moderate birth weight, higher growth bulls. And just to show you that I wasn't, um, that that wasn't just the case in a single population, this is a second breed that's used in the South or in temperate Australia. And same thing, we've got birth weight along the x-axis here and 400 day weight on the y-axis. So lighter birth weight, heavier birth weight, below average 400 day weight, above average 400 day weight. See that same trend typically as birth weight increases, so does 400 day weight. We've got these bulls down here that are above average for birth weight, but don't have the corresponding 400 day growth. And then we've got these bulls in this quartile that are below average for birth weight and have above average 400 day weight. So good growth for 400 day weight. And so I just wanted to show you this just to show that no matter which population we're looking in, there will be bulls that are curve benders that break the curve and don't follow the accepted or the, the generally observed relationship. And these are the sorts of bulls that we want to use to utilize in breeding programs to get the combination of genetics that is suitable for what we're trying to do. In this case, uh, selecting a bull for use over first calf heifers. So a second problem, moving on from the fact that lower birth weight is generally correlated with lower growth, is that sometimes it can be difficult to balance calving ease direct and calving ease daughters. And I guess when I think about these two EBVs, what I generally think about um, is that calving ease direct is all about how well will that size calves be born. And so a lot of that is shape and will and willingness to push. I didn't talk about that earlier. But calving ease direct to me is about the front half of that bull. What are his shoulders like? Is he a good shape? Are his progeny going to pop out of the heifers. Whereas calving his daughters is more about what are his daughter's pelvis size uh, and willingness to push. So to me, they're um, opposite ends of the animal. Calving his direct is very much about the front end. Calving his daughters is about the back end. And we have to be a little bit careful because sometimes if you've got a small, well-shaped calf that pops out easily, and she's a heifer, she may not necessarily grow into a big roomy heifer with a good good sized pelvis. And so that's why it's important to balance these two and make sure that we're selecting for positive um, calving ease, both direct and daughters to avoid any potential problems. So this is an example of a bull where he's got good calving ease direct. We can see he's in the top 10% of the breed. So his calves shouldn't have, have too much trouble coming out of two-year-old heifers. However, his daughters themselves, um, their calving ease daughters is, is well below breed average. And so they may have trouble calving. So what we want to do once again is look for a bull with both of these traits. And this is a good example of the bull here. He's got good calving ease direct and good calving ease daughters. And so not only should he be able to have, have calves born that don't require lots of assistance, but his daughters should grow up into heifers and cows that don't require assistance when they're calving. So I've just shown you a lot of EBV percentile graphs 
and I guess I haven't shown you where to find it. So um, if you go to the Breed Society's page that you're interested in looking for bulls from, um, they will all have links to animal and EBV inquiries to search the breed plan catalogues and online breed plan system. And that is where you can find the EBV percentile graph and all of these EBVs. So um, that's via the individual animals page. And if we have a look here, I've got a, a particular animal and there's two ways you can bring up the EBV graph. You can click on the view button where it says EBV graph, or you can click on this graph icon. I'm just going to see if I could show you that live. So yes, that seems to have worked. All right, so this is just the Limousin EBV inquiry. So um, I'm going to select just publish sires and just sort by, we'll go domestic maternal. And so this will bring up each individual animal and then I can select one and you'll see I've got the ability to click on that graph icon and it loads and then we've got an EBV percentile graph for that individual animal. So that's how we can do that via the online search system. Okay, so Martin, how are we going for, for questions? Have we had any come in at this stage? No, Katrina. It's uh, I must say, you, you, everybody must be completely satisfied with what they're um, uh, what's being presented to them at the present time. But uh, yeah, no, I cannot see any uh, questions coming up in the uh, in the chat room. So yep. Okay. Well, we'll we'll keep going. We'll continue on. Yes. Thank you. Yep. And I, I don't think I said it at the start, and I meant to. If anyone's got any questions as we're going through, please put them in the chat box. And that way, when I pause, I'll, I'll answer them then. Okay, so as I've just shown, there's a, there's a number of relationships between the breed plan traits. And I guess if we think about, well, how are we gonna select our heifer bull? If we select for one or only a couple of traits, there may be some unintended consequences as a result of the relationships between those traits. Now, this isn't a heifer bull example. The example we typically use is if we selected just for growth by selecting on 600 day weight alone. So here I've got a bull that is well above breed average for 600 day weight. He's plus 102 for 600 day weight. And the breed average at the time for those calves was plus 40, so he's 62 kilos above above breed average for for that trait. But what what selecting just on growth is likely to do is to decrease our calving ease, which we see here. He's very um, negative, quite a lot below breed average here for calving ease. He's quite heavy for birth weight, so breed average is 1.6, but he's plus seven, and he's got a heavy mature cow weight. Breed average is plus 41, he's plus 80. So that would be what happened if we um, selected just on growth. And I guess the converse of that is if we just selected on positive carving, like I was just showing you, in general, we'd see that our growth decreases because we're, we know that the general relationship is that as uh, birth weight and carving ease, sorry, as birth weight gets lighter and birth weight gets lighter, then we typically see a decrease in growth if we don't use a curve bender animal. So I guess that brings us back to then, how much emphasis should we put on individual traits? Which traits are we interested in? Which, how much, how much emphasis do we put on them? And so I think in this case, selection indexes provide a really simple solution to what is quite a complex problem of having to know which traits to emphasize in your selection strategy. So you don't have to know how much emphasis to give to different traits, and they really are all about providing an EBV for profit, so dollar value in a specific production system slash market scenario. So I think, What's really advantageous of selecting a heifer bull via a selection index is that it allows you to select a bull that's profitable for your production system 
while also being suitable to use over first calf heifers. So we're not having to pick one or the other. We're not having to pick a easy calving, low growth bull that's suitable for first calf heifers, but may not be the most profitable for our production system. We're looking to select a bull that's got good genetics for first calf heifers, so good calving, but also got the growth and the carcass attributes that are going to make the, the production system that you're in and the, the bulls and or the animals you're, you're producing for that production system the most profitable that you can. So I'm going to run through a breed plan guide to animal selection and explain how I would use the information to select a bull and then I'm going to do a case study with a, a heifer bull. So um, the first part of this is to identify the selection index of most relevance to you. Now I know that um, there can be a little bit of confusion out there in the industry as to how you select a selection index. So I'd just like to start by saying that there are a number of breed societies that have selection indexes published and they are designed um, to be based around production systems that are common to that to that particular breed being used in. And we are, are aware that it can be a bit challenging as a commercial producer to understand which selection index might be most relevant to you, particularly when you're only doing your bull selection once or twice a year at most. So what we have done on the Breed Plan website is uh, developed a number of new selection index tip sheets. So I'm going to go slightly off topic again and just say to anyone that if you're looking for any information on Breed Plan, the Breed Plan Help Centre on the website is the place to go first. It's got a searchable um, search that will bring up any of the, the tip sheets that we've got listed. You don't have to go uh, searching through, put your keywords in. So what we have developed is a range of uh, using selection indexes tip sheets for each of the breeds. So if you put in something like the country selection index and using, this will bring up all of the selection index documentation um, on how to use those, what, what selection indexes the Breed Society has published and how to use them. Some of them have a flow chart that helps you make that decision. I'm going to show you one in my case study in a minute. Um, and they've all got a nice dot point explanation of what each of the indexes is, is focused on to try and simplify that selection process for you. Okay, so hopefully we've identified the selection index of most relevance to your production system. Then what we're going to do is rank animals on the selection index using the online search and sort. And then we're going to consider individual EBVs of importance. And that's, that's important because while an animal can have the same index value, the way in which it gets there can be very different. So um, if we have a look at these ones, for example, we can see that bull A and bull C are above breed average for calving is direct, whereas bull B is below breed average. So that's probably not a bull that I would be using over heifers. Um, we can see variation in their birth weight, in their gestation length, in their growth profiles, um, in their carcass traits, in IMF, all those traits, uh, docility particularly, we can see there, there's a bit of variation there. So it's really important that we don't just use the selection index as the only um, way in which we select animals, but we consider those individual ABVs of importance too. And then finally, we need to consider other traits of importance. So it's not all about the breed plan figures. We need to make sure that we've checked the pedigree, fertility, so such as via the bull check or VBBSE um, that many seed stock producers will perform on their sale bulls. We need to be aware of genetic condition status, so that could be things like horn pole or um, other genetic conditions that are in that particular breed that we're considering. We need to look at the bull and make sure he has got good structure. He needs to be able to walk, he needs to be able to serve cows. And lastly, we need to make sure that we're happy with his temperament. He needs to have a good temperament and be a, a bull that we can handle. So 
I'm not going to go into this too much, but importantly, most of this can be done prior to sale day. You can certainly do all of the pre-planned steps, so one to three, um, and there are a number of other important traits that you can check online. So pedigree, you can check online, genetic condition status, and the bull check results are often available in the sale catalogues, allowing you to search and sort prior to bull day, um, sale day, and then obviously, the advantage of doing that is you get a list of uh, bulls that are for sale in the catalogue that suit what you want in terms of their genetics and then all you need to do on sale day is check their structure, check their temperament, make sure you're happy and discard any from your potential bidding list that you are not happy with. So I'm going to run through a case study. Um, and in this particular case study, we've got a black body producer in southern New South Wales. I figured a lot of the people on if you're in southern New South Wales will be either Hereford or Angus uh, breeders given the Riverina area. So I thought we'd combine it and look at a black baldy producer. And this particular black baldy producer is looking to use a Hereford sire over first calf Angus heifers. So our first step is to identify which of the Hereford selection indexes is relevant. So if we look at the first question on this flow chart, do we live in a winter or summer dominated rainfall region, being the Riverina, that would be winter. And so then our next question is, are you using Hereford bulls in a straight bred Hereford herd or for crossbreeding, doing black baldies? So we're crossbreeding, which means that our selection index of relevance is the Southern Baldy Maternal Index. Now, just a very quick overview of that index. It's designed for use by a commercial crossbred herd. The Hereford bulls are being used over a Bostaurus cow base. Um, selected heifers are retained, so maternal traits are still important. And it's targeting, uh, steers are targeting 30 kilogram carcasses with 10 mil P8 fat. Um, surplus heifers, so those that we're not retaining, are targeting 270 kilogram carcasses with 12 millimetres P8 fat. And they're being finished uh, and slaughtered at around 20 to 22 months of age. Okay, so I'm gonna play a video of how I select them. Um, I'm aware that it's a little bit blurry if we've got time and people are interested, we might be able to do a live demo at the end. But basically, I've opened the animal inquiry or the EBV inquiry for the, the particular breed, and I have selected currently listed for sale. So that will bring up any animal that's listed for sale. I don't want uh, females, so I've selected animal is male, and then I've scrolled down and told it that I want to select and sort by the Southern Baldy Maternal Index. And then that brings up a list of all of the current males that are available for sale in the breed listed downward by their, their Southern Baldy Maternal Index. So that gives us 484 bulls. So that's just the first step, or second step, sorry, ranking them on their selection index. But we know that not all of those 484 bulls are going to be heifer bulls. So if we go back to what we were saying earlier, those traits of importance, calving ease direct, I'm going to select on calving ease daughters in this place because it's a um, index where some, some heifers, select heifers are kept for self-replacing purposes. So we're gonna look at both of the calving ease EBVs. Gestation length, birth weight, and then also because we don't want low growth animals, we're going to look at 400 day weight. And so these are the traits I'm going to put some parameters around. So I'm looking for easier calving. So I'm going to say that I want the EBV range to be breed average or above uh, for both calving ease direct and calving ease daughters. I want a short gestation. So I want the gestation length EBV to be breed average or below with below or more negative uh, EBVs denoting more, uh, denoting shorter gestation lengths. I want a moderate birth weight. So I'm gonna say that they can be in the 55th percentile or below. And I'd like them to have a heavier 400 day weight. So I want them to be breed average or above. Now I've got 
a little slide um, a little bit further on, but I want to say it here and repeat it again as well. These are not gospel. These are EBV ranges that um, they're, they're not particularly uh, selective. They're just breed average or around breed average. The EBV range that you are comfortable with can vary by operation to operation. You might want more pressure, less pressure on particular traits, that's fine. But for this example, we're hovering around that, that breed average um, and either above or below, depending on which way the EBV is desirable. Okay, so same as before, I'm going to select animals that are currently listed for sale you go, that are male, and I want them to display via their Southern Baldy Maternal Index. But you'll see here, there's min and max for each of the EBVs. So in this case, I'm telling it that I want to be above breed average for calving ease direct and daughters, below breed average for gestation length, and below the 55th percentile for birth weight, and above breed average for 400 day weight. And then I will hit search and it will bring up a list of bulls. And in this case, we've sorted our 400 odd bulls to 92. So with a very simple sort, not particularly hard criteria, this has now got us a bull that has um, the carving attributes we want for a heifer bull, but also listed by Southern Baldy Maternal Index. So we can see those that are gonna be most profitable for our production system. So I've just brought up the individual EBV graphs for EBV percentile graphs for a couple of those bulls that are in the top five. I think this is one and two, but it might be one and three. Um, and we can see that what, what this has allowed us to do is we've got a very profitable bull for Southern Baldy Index, but it's also a bull that's got easier calving ease direct um, just above breed average, so still easier for calving ease daughters, shorter gestation length and a moderate birth weight being just below the 40th percentile. Um, it's also got good growth, so 400 day it's in the top, I'd be generous and say top 5%, it's probably less than that, it's probably top 3 or so. Um, 400 day weights got good growth and so that is the sort of bull that this search will bring up for us and the same here this is another bull he's got good calving ease direct and daughters shorter gestation length a much lighter birth weight uh, good growth profile and is still very profitable on that southern baldy index so as i said before i didn't go particularly hard on those uh, percentiles, I just went breed average or below. You may, when you're doing this yourself, decide that actually you want to be a lot more um, hard on certain traits. You might say, no, I, I'm using him on my heifers. I want to be really certain of the calving ease. So you might, for example, decide to go to, for the 30th percentile or above for both the calving eases and the 30th percentile for, for growth to get some, some good growth genetics in there. And if you did that, there'd be currently 43 bulls for sale that meet those criteria. So at this point, I also wanted to show you how to find the percentiles. So when you're going to the EBV inquiry, um, you've got your options to select animals for sale, put in your minimum and maximum EBV traits, and also, um, you can find the percentiles by clicking on the percentiles. This brings out the percentile bands table and you can say, right, well, I wanna be in the top 30% and that gives you 30% um, value for calving ease, direct and daughters in limousin there. And if you would go across the same for 400 day weight. So that's how you use the percentile table to inform your EBV decisions. But as I said, um, there's no hard and fast rules. You don't have to be in a certain percentile range. Um, it really depends what you're looking for and which traits there that you want to put a bit more emphasis on. Okay, so our last step then is to consider other traits of importance. So by doing this process, we've got bulls that suit our production system, but also bulls that are gonna be suitable to use over first calf heifers. 
but that's not the only thing only thing that's important. We need to, as I said earlier, check their pedigree, see if they've got bull check results and have passed, um, genetic condition status, are they horned, are they polled, are they carriers for any other particular genetic conditions, and really importantly, check their structure, make sure you're happy with their structure and their temperament. It doesn't matter how good his genetic potential is as a heifer bull, if he's not sound or he's not of good temperament, then he should not be used and he needs to be crossed off the, the potential list. So I guess then in conclusion, when we're selecting a sire for use over first calf heifers, I think the breed plan traits of particular importance are birth weight, gestation length, calving ease direct and calving ease daughters. And as we've seen, identifying curve bend bulls, so bulls that don't follow the normal trend, allow you to utilise genetics for calving ease while not sacrificing genetics for growth. And when you're selecting your sire, I think it's really important that that is done in the context of the overall production system. So you want a bull that is profitable for your production system while also being suitable for use over heifers. Uh, there's a range of information available on both the Breed Plan website and the SBTS and TBTS websites. I think a couple of them are up as handouts as well. So I would recommend if you're interested in using the Breed Plan information for animal selection, having a look at the Breed Plan Guide to Animal Selection. There's those steps that I covered um, and there's a little bit more information on the sort of preparation that can be done by a buyer before sale day to make sure that you've got a good shopping list of bulls that suit your system and have the genetics that you're after before you get to the sale in person so that all you've got to do is check structure and temperament on the day. Um, we have an SBTS and TBTS technical note on making bull selection decisions for heifer matings. That's got a little bit more of the information that I covered tonight. Um, and I've also put our contacts up via that QR code for SBTS and TBTS technical officers. So um, there's three of us, Boyd and I are based in Armidale, Paul is based in Rockhampton. Um, happy to answer questions if anyone wants any further information and our contact details are also available via both the SBTS and TBTS websites. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Katrina. Um, yes, there's been a couple of questions come in. Uh, firstly, uh, yep. question is, how important is milk EBVs in bull selection? Okay. <laughs> um, I guess I would start off by saying that when we think about the milk EBV, we're talking about maternal contribution to 200 day weight of the calf. So it's not how much milk does she produce. We're not, you know, in the, in the dairy industry, they obviously have milk EBVs that are quality and quantity. The milk EBV for breed plan is maternal contribution to 200 day growth. Um, so that's, that's a combination both of her quality of milk, her quantity of milk and her mothering ability. Um, I guess, I think that in general, people get a little bit too hung up on milk, that perhaps we don't need to be so concerned about it. Um, I think milk is important in the context of your environment. So if you have a harder country, for example, you might not have the environment to support high milk EBV cows and in which case it's important to know then that you wouldn't necessarily want to be pushing well above breed average for milk EBVs because your environment may not support them. Um, conversely, if you've got a really good environment, lots of feed available and you know that you can support those high milk EBV cows, then that may be something that that you're prepared to, to look at. That said, I think that we need to think about it in the context of how it is. So if I've if I've got an animal with a, a milk EBV of plus 10 and I've got another animal with a milk EBV of plus 5, so we've got a, a difference of 5 in the milk EBV between those two animals, 
that means that at 200 day weight, the maternal contribution and the difference between those animals will be 2.5 kilograms at 200 days. So I guess in that context, it's mm. important to know that we're not going to see, a, I, I would challenge anyone to see that two and a half kilo difference by eye. So to me, it's it's not a hugely important trait in terms of it's certainly something I'd think about depending on my environment, but it's not a trait that I would necessarily be chasing and putting a lot of selection pressure on if there were other traits that are important in my breeding objective. Well, Katrina, I think on a, on a, a couple of the examples that you showed there uh, with the bulls, I know yep. there was one particularly, I think had well, was, um, because you got 50% as the middle of the index selection. Um, and yep, there, was one, there was one there, there was one there that was like negative. Um, yeah, it was, it was like around sort of, yeah, 45%, uh, 45 on that index. Uh, and then there was another one that was, you know, the plus side. Is yep. that, is like, again, I suppose the question being, how significant is that? Like, would you, if, if the bull, um, if the bull traits was all, tick, 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 tick boxes for ease of carsing, you know, 200 day, 400 day weight, but then they've yep. got a, uh, they've got a, you know, significant negative for uh, milk production. Would that deter you from selecting that bull or, or how, like how far does it have to be before it would deter you from looking at selecting that bull? It's, yeah, um, I, I guess it's, it's personal preference. So, yeah. I mean, for me personally, if he was, just a bit below breed average and in the 55th percentile, absolutely not. That wouldn't deter me, um, mm -hmm. particularly if I was running cattle in a, in a harder environment. Um, now I say that, but I know that when I was down in Gippsland a couple of years ago, which is the sort of environment that can support a high milking cow, um, they didn't want high milk particularly there either because they didn't want so much milk that the calf couldn't keep up and they were having mastitis problems. So I guess, yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't let it deter me. If you had two bulls that were equal and one had a better milk EBV than the other, then that might be something you consider. But in general, I think I would personally be happy with breed average or around breed average and I would I wouldn't let a slightly below or a slightly above breed average milk EBV deter me from a a bull that I liked everything else about him. Oh that's good. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, how is carving ease direct data recorded at yep. the uh, seed stock level? Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I didn't go into that at all, um, but I there is a couple of tip sheets. So if you're interested, they're on the Bree Plan website on how we record birth difficulty scores. But calving ease EBVs are calculated from a combination of birth difficulty scores, which are scored on a one, two, six scale. Um, off the top of my head, the seed stock producer will have one as unassisted. So that's anything that calves, particularly if you're doing daily visits um, between, between visits with no assistance. One is a light pool, which is uh, one person and no mechanical assistance. Three is a hard pool, which is two or more people or mechanical assistance required. Five is a Caesar, so when you have to get the vet out to cut the calf out. Five is a malpresentation. We don't use that in the analysis, but it's there. Um, and six, I have never seen anyone in Australia use. Six is elective surgery before the calf has, sorry, before the cow has, um, started calving and my only example of where I think that would be used in an Australian context is say you had a cow that was very close to calving, she fell over, broke her leg and you had to cut the calf out um, to save it. That six, I have never seen a six come in um, in my time entering data. So I, I would say most people were looking at that one, two, three and four in terms of the severity of assistance and then A5 for male presentation. So those carving ease EBVs are calculated from the birth difficulty scores. 
from the birth weight and from the gestation length because there's relationships between um, carving ease, birth weight and gestation length in the analysis. Oh, okay, thanks Katrina. Um, we might just turn our cameras back on at this stage. Uh, yep. um, uh, but look, yeah, no, I don't think I've had um, any other questions or chat come in uh, unless anybody's got um, any last minute <laughs> driving questions that they want to throw at you, Katrina. So, um, yep. because we're, uh, yeah, we've still probably got about uh, uh, five minutes to go before we finish, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, no, it sounds, uh, it sounds very interesting, um, Katrina, and I, yeah, yeah, there's a few things that I've learned myself tonight, um, and particularly, I think, with the, um, you're showing us there with the, the breed plan website, you know, and using its select, selection indexes, that is, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's quite a very helpful tool, um, which again, I'm sure many of us could take the full advantage of. Um, but the uh, the bull check, what's the? Uh, could you just explain on that a little bit further? It's um... yeah, um, I can give you a very basic overview. I think uh, Shane might be able to provide a lot more information okay. in his mm -hmm. webinar. His um, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we might have we'll, it until then, yeah. But um, mm. yeah. So as as a very quick overview, it's done by a vet. Um, it's a cattle cattle vet uh, product, and it involves doing a physical exam. Um, you can do semen quality, so under the microscope, and so it's the I I saw it done once, not as just as a demonstration at a, a field day I was presenting at, the local LLS vet came out and did a, a bit of a demo. So they did a um, structural assessment, assessment of like the, the testes and the sheath, um, did a semen sample collection and then put it, put it under the microscope to have a look for abnormalities and things like that. So it, it works its way through, but there's a, a number of different components. Okay. Well, thank you. As I say, yet yeah, no, I think there's been no more questions have come in, um, uh, yep. Katrina. So, yeah, uh, actually, hang on. Oh, there's one that's come in. Will there be a link to be able to watch again? And yes, this has been recorded. And uh, yes, there will be a, a link provided on the um, River and Local Land Services website under the events tab. Yeah, so certainly is available. Thank you all. Thanks for the uh, attendees, the registered attendees that have taken the time to uh, to join us tonight. And more importantly, thank you, Katrina, for your um, you. uh, for your for your great advice and words of wisdom on the uh, the curve bender, as we call it, uh, which uh, yeah, which as I say, sounds like a um, uh, yeah a, a way to go forward for uh, trying to get those uh, yeah heifer bulls or selecting of heifer bulls for that ease of carving. It, it's it, yeah, it yeah. sounds like a no-brainer to me. And again, we will be um, we'll be back uh, at the same place, same time in seven days uh, on the Wednesday, the sixteenth uh, of March, uh, starting at uh, seven thirty. Thanks again, and look forward to seeing you all join us at that stage. Cheerio. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.